and we're live. Well, we're recording. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the, well, not welcome back, welcome to the first ever episode <laughs> of The Catalyst. It's a very interesting and mysterious name. We're going to get more into it today with your two hosts, Amit and Alex. Alex from Ticker, Ticker Symbol U, Amit from the Amit Kukraja Show. Uh, we teamed up. We said, you know what? There is some stuff that's missing in the finance space. There are a lot of creators and there's not that many discussions that are happening the way we think they could be happening. And that's we are that's why we're here to present you with the first ever episode of The Catalyst. Now, The Catalyst, what's the point of this? So Alex and I had a debate uh, about three weeks ago. It was on my channel and it had to do with Palantir, our beautiful friend Palantir. And this is right after the CEO uh, did an eight minute monologue before their earnings report and issued a letter in which he was quoting old dead German people. Uh, about the philosophical values around why his company is tanking 30%. And so I, I was head over heels for it. I'm like, this is beautiful. This is poetry to me. This is, I, I love this stuff. And Alex was like, admit, this makes zero sense. There is no reason why this guy should be spouting philosophy right now when his company is tanking. We need more direct forward uh, conversations. And what that triggered and the discussion that triggered for almost an hour that kept about 300 people in a live chat entertained was that there are pragmatic and philosophical explanations and perspectives to take in the world of finance. And I think those discussions aren't happening as much. A lot of YouTube is a lot of clickbait stuff, a lot of buy this, buy this, don't buy the dip, buy the dip. And it's all stuff that, yes, gets views. And as content creators, we have to get views. But is it deeper? Is there a reason people are coming back for something more than sensationalized headlines? And the goal of the catalyst is to actually create that. So in a nutshell, if we could become the Lex Friedman of finance, which are these deep philosophical but pragmatic discussions around really interesting topics in the stocks, business, and tech space for the catalyst, then that would be a, a big win for us. Huge win. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think the other thing that's going on a lot in the YouTube finance space is a lot of like unnecessary drama between, you know, content creators. So uh, we kind of wanted to flip the script and say, hey, instead of attacking each other, why don't we create a platform for real, healthy, good debate around the way different companies are run, the technologies behind them, the philosophies behind them, and have a place to just sort of hash out ideas instead of attacking each other, right? So rather than just attacking creators uh, for picking stocks or for picking investment strategies that are now seemingly not the best or seemingly maybe maybe they were good at the time, how can we analyze those and go deeper on those and how can we actually have meaningful discussions? Along with talking about fun stuff like Elon Musk getting sued for $250 billion when it comes to Dogecoin. That's right. That's a fun conversation and there's a lot of catalysts involved to have this conversation. So every topic we cover on this podcast, it's a weekly podcast for now, you should imagine uh, the topic being a catalyst or a springboard for a larger discussion. And our goal over time, it's not gonna be perfect over the first you know, couple episodes, our goal over time is to really make sure those catalysts lead to meaningful conversations. If anyone has watched the breaking points with Crystal and Sagar, that's also something we're trying to go after. Really two unique perspectives attacking stuff that's happening in the mainstream news way better than CNN or Fox ever could. And Absolutely. Be. Having said that, uh, oh, we're also going to have some dope guests because Alex has some amazing connections. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have some CEOs of public. We're going to have some crazy people on the show. So it's going to be awesome. Yeah, I'm, right. I'm definitely excited to see like uh, how those people also attack these same ideas, right? So it's not just going to be us two talking the whole time. We're going to get a lot of diverse perspectives. So I'm really excited to you know spread good ideas and see what happens from there. So because we were talking about finance content creators, we're going to cover sort of two main topics today and then have those be our catalysts as for our introductory episode. Uh, the first one is about what does it mean to be a finance content creator? And the reason this is so interesting is because Alex and I are both in this space. Alex came into this space uh, about a year and a half before I did. And when I got into this space, you know, it was, it was really interesting. I got into the space when the bull market had kind of ended. Why does a bull market matter for being a finance creator? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. And I realized like, like what it means to like pick a stock or pick an audience and develop a niche around a particular investing style. It's a, it's a fundamentally different form of content creation versus a Mr. Beast type of style where you create a video and it can literally attract the entire world to watch it. So Alex, I, I, why did you start finance YouTube? And like, how do you, how do you, how do you, what do you think it means to be a creator in, in this space? In particular? Sure. Yeah. So I, I started about a year and a half ago and I started because I saw a very specific need on YouTube. So like you mentioned earlier, my channel, is all about covering ARK Invest, their research, and then their trading behavior that that research is linked to. And what I was seeing at the time was a lot of finance YouTubers were talking a lot about their holdings and you should go buy this because Kathy Wood just bought it and look how many shares of this company they just bought. And what I wasn't seeing a lot of was the why. What's going on? What's the science behind these stocks? What are the decisions that are resulting in these trades? You know, why is she so bullish on Tesla? Why is she not buying 
Google stock or Microsoft stock or these other great companies. What is the research that's driving these decisions? So I decided to start a channel where I talk about, hey, here's what disruptive innovation is versus just technology, what it means, what they're looking for, what is a platform, what is an ecosystem, what are the kind of top holdings and why are they at the top of these different ARC funds? What is yes. thematic investing and sort of like answering all these questions? And so because I was attacking a very specific niche that was very popular at the time, that's kind of how I grew my audience as a finance YouTuber. And ARC was exploding when you kind of started. And, and the reason I think your channel exploded with them is not just because ARC was exploding. Um, there, the amount of times I've been sent a ticker symbol you video just on Facebook. <laughs> Because they're like, yo, you got to check out this deep dive. And like people don't send deep dives of Unity stock to random people, right? They send a deep dive if like the guy's video or girl's video actually really does explain the company and the pros and cons and all that stuff. Um, and I think your channel exploded because you took something that was very popular, but you actually answered the why she's buying Zoom, why she's buying Teladoc um, much more deeply than other people. Now, the question for you is like, in terms of YouTube and finance content in general, do you think you kind of have to be boxed in to one thing to grow a channel? Or do you think you can expand from there? I, I definitely think you have to start being boxed in. So the, the sage advice seems to be pick your niche. And for sure, you have to start by uh, addressing the concerns or the problems and the challenges of one person and then letting the internet solve it for everyone with that same problem, right? The scale of the internet pretty much guarantees that it's going to find you know, all of the people who are asking that same question, what is the deal with Tesla stock? Why is ARK Invest so bullish on Teladoc? So on and so forth. And so that's kind of how I started. And what about you? Why did you start uh, in finance YouTube, you know, just this past year? Well, well, part of the reason was I was watching guys like you and meet Kevin and all this. I was like, I could do this too. It's like, <laughs> like <laughs> sure. Like, I'm, yeah, I'm a stock market junkie. And I, I remember discovering your videos well before I started. And I was just like, this guy, like, it's just, I personally enjoyed love the deep dives. Like, I, I love going deep into it. I love the humor, the entertainment of it, the day-to-day -day updates of the market. And so, you know, I already had a significant portion of money in pounds here. So I was like, let me make a couple of videos. Let's see if people care. Uh, and apparently people cared. And same thing with you. I mean, I think there was a lot of people talking about pounds here on the internet, but they weren't answering some of the larger macro level questions of why this stock is so powerful or why this company could be so big. And I think my videos kind of answer that, which is why I developed my audience. Um, but it does, it, it does beg the question of just like, Am I now allowed to talk about Teladoc because people know me as the Pounder guy? Are you allowed to talk about Coca-Cola and, 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 and Home Depot or dividend paying stocks if you're the high growth tech guy? It's like it's a weird niche to be in because people have classified you in a way. And granted, everyone has a short attention span. So like Alex is the growth tech guy. This is the other guy. Like I go to different people for different things. How do we welcome people into the diverse perspectives we have while keeping the algorithm happy? I think, I think that's the hardest thing to figure out as a content creator. Sure, I, I totally agree. And you kind of see this uh, split in the finance community where people take one of two options, right? They'll only talk in their niche because that's what makes the algorithm happy. Yes. And then other people will just be like, hey, this is what makes me happy. And I'm going to talk about what makes me happy. Uh, and, th and that's actually the camp that I've started leaning on. Uh, and I think that's a lot more fulfilling because yes, your audience might change and you might lose a few subscribers along the way, but ultimately creating content that you're passionate about uh, will make you feel successful in a way that a million subscribers can't make you feel successful, right? So I, I, I encourage YouTube creators, especially finance creators, if you have a good idea, even if it's outside your niche, you should share it and you should open that discussion and catalyze the conversation, right? Yeah, no, I, I think it's incredibly important. I mean, I'm I'm going to be launching a startup in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to be talking about it on my channel and the people who followed me did not follow me because of a startup. Uh, Everything Money is a popular, interesting YouTube channel. They did a video today called uh, Six Things I Wish I Had Learned in My 20s. It was just a guy talking about self-development and it has like 6,000 views. Why? Because people might care about your thoughts about, you know, what you did in your 20s uh, because they respect you for something else initially. I think the trick here is can I get people to actually discover who I am? This is the hardest problem in the world. It's, it's, it's a topic we'll discover many times on the podcast. How do we get in front of people so that they can actually click on something meaningful enough to get them into our universe? Because if you get sure. them into your universe, you have a, a, an abundance of opportunity. But then when they're in your universe, how do you keep them there? And, and you've got to diversify in terms of content. If you're going to be talking about Palantir or ARK Invest forever, it's going to get boring. I, I'm going to go watch that Everything Money video, but... One thing I do when I think about creating financial content is I ask the question, what do I wish I knew two years ago? Like, what can I go and tell myself from 18 months ago or two years ago, you know, that would really help me speed up that journey for the next guy who's two years behind me? 
So when I create content, that's sort of what I'm thinking about is like, how has my outlook on different stocks, different companies, how do I evaluate them today versus two years ago? Uh, and how can I share that with people who are two years earlier in their journey than I am today? How do you feel about some of the recent finance beef? We don't have to put out names, but there are some creators saying, don't buy the dip because the market's going to crash. And there's other uh, people saying, uh, look, this is horrible advice because you should constantly DCA. You should never time the market. Uh, we've seen people time the market back in January and some of the blowback they get from that. Do you think it's even worth putting out a piece of content that is so definitive about buying or not buying because it locks you into this pigeonhole of you have to be right or wrong? Or do you think people should not care that much when people offer this like sooner financial advice? Uh, you know, I'm really torn. Um, I definitely think that you should be really careful when you definitively look into the camera and tell somebody to do something with their money because that really affects people. People, You earn people's trust on the internet and that can re really burn people even if it's not you. And those yeah. people may never even speak up. You may never even hear about them in the comments, but I actually got a few tweets where people have been like, hey, I listened to your thesis on this stock and I put $70,000 in it and now I'm down a lot of money. And you know what? That tweet has kept me up plenty of nights. And now I'm very careful about you know the way I talk about stocks, the way I tell people to dollar cost average in. I try not to give price targets anymore because that tweet is a real human being taking their hard earned money that they spent time collecting and trusting you with it, even though they have no idea who you are and you have no idea who they are, right? So I think I think the only thing you should definitively tell people to do with their money is talk to a financial advisor. Yeah. I think that's the one piece of advice that you can say, hey, you should go, if you have all this money, the next thing you should do is get real professional advice on how to use it. But this, you know, this video is about a company that I'm really excited about. Here's where I'm putting my money. Here's why, right? And here's what I've learned in my research on this company. And then the next YouTuber can say, hey, here's why I don't agree with that decision. And now they're talking about different ideas about the same market, right? They're looking at the same data and coming to two different conclusions. That's healthy debate, right? That's what we're trying to promote here on The Catalyst. Yeah, finance finance media is so interesting because like none of us are financial advisors and like any of the financial advisors that saw us on YouTube, they like cringe a little bit because they're like, we can't say any of this stuff publicly, but we can because we're not certified as long as we say this is not financial advice. But though, the, the idea is how do we keep the audience entertained? And in this particular niche, there's no boxing, there's no like, you know, makeup gurus. It's just pure stocks analysis and stocks were boring for the up until like 2020 until they started getting exciting and that's when this niche kind of really started to thrive so keeping people's attention sometimes leads to this like hyper bombastic sensationalized definitive conclusion around buying the dip or not buying the dip or putting 70 grand or not putting 70 grand and i think we have a really big responsibility to make sure it's like hey just a guy on the internet making a video i appreciate your attention but this is in no way uh, something where you should take it as, as real, real advice. Because I, I could tell that keeps you, I mean, I've gotten comments about me and Palantir. I was I was talking about it at $19, like it looks pretty cheap. Now I'd be like, yeah, it's at like $6 now. How do you think? <laughs> it kind of sucks, right? But at the end of the day, it's like, well, you have some level of influence at the end. I definitely appreciate that. And so one thing I always try to do now is I try to talk more about the company. You know, one thing I'm really excited about when it comes to Unity, when it comes to Tesla, I focus on the engineering, the science, the things that scale really well. And I let people make their own mind up about what that means for the valuation and for where the company will be in a few years. Because honestly, I could provide anyone can provide a valuation or a price target. And that number changes so fast, right? It changes with quarterly earnings. It changes with daily news. It changes with things completely out of the company's control, like we're seeing with this macro environment and interest rates are rising. So every stock in cryptocurrency is falling. Well, that has nothing to do with these companies, right? Especially the ones that don't need to borrow money in this environment. So how do you disentangle that? I don't think it can be done in one 15, 20 minute video by one amateur investor, right? So I think there's a lot to be said about what, where we can do a lot of good and what kind of things make sense to cover and what kind of things make sense to speculate on, you know, valuations, price target and all that, and then stick a warning sticker that says, hey, I'm giving you my best guess, but I'm not a professional at this. So take it with a huge grain of salt. Okay, I've got, I've got a couple more questions on this before we transition. Who would be your three to five, uh, and, and we'll go back and forth on this, uh, catalyst in the stock investing community in terms of big figures? Now, what I mean is TMZ needs Justin Bieber to do stuff to have content. TMZ needs Ariana Grande. To, to, so like we have some key figures that you and I both follow religiously. And when they do something, when they tweet something, it matters to us. So one of the obvious ones I think is Kathy Wood, right? So we'll put out there. Sure. She's one of the catalysts for the finance community. Do you have any in mind? 
Uh, yeah, I think I think a huge catalyst for the community is Elon Musk, right? Like, I think he's he's a huge no brainer when it comes to things like Twitter and Dogecoin, which we can get into a little later. But that would be mine. I think Who's another one, one is Bill Ackman <laughs> when he comes out and is like, "We need to raise these damn interest rates." He's uh, he's one. He's up there. Mm-hmm. I would say Michael Burry is up there. Michael Burry's up there. All right, and to round it out, number five, I would say Jim Cramer. Whether we like Jim Cramer, that's a good one. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was like, when he says something, people listen, you know, whether they want to agree or disagree. So it's so interesting because in the finance view, because these people influence thumbnails, these people influence click through rate. I mean, these people really, for sure. at CNBC every day, Elon Musk is, is on. People say the thumbnail title thing is exclusive to YouTube. It's, a, it's everywhere in the world, every social media website, there's a picture and a title that gets someone to click. And Elon Musk has been used on probably 99.9% of them on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good point. Yeah, I mean, even Wall Street Journal articles have hero images and provocative titles to get you to click and read the article, right? And there, I mean, that's a really respectable financial publication, which I think speaks a lot to like, well, this is just human psychology, right? Like YouTube makes you fit it in this box and have this many characters. But fundamentally, media is, I need to get you to click so that you can read the thing underneath the click, right? And we're visually based, even even on purely audio platforms. Me and you have talked about this in the past. Why do CDs have cover art? It's purely audio, right? But it's to get you to look at and pick up the CD for the first time in a store, right? Like, yep. you know? Even Spotify, they have these canvases. So when you're listening to a song, there's like this stuff moving in the background. And I looked at their LinkedIn post, the other, they have a job entry open just for someone to build these canvases because it's like so visually interactive for people, even though it's just a music song. Yeah. Um, okay, last question on this, uh, uh, when this, what what is the catalyst for this mar for this niche on YouTube to continue getting bigger even if the market sucks? So let's say we have a flat market the next two years or a down market. What do you think is going to keep people entertained in finance YouTube? I think it's being able to like, in my opinion, right? And I'd love to hear your opinion on this too. I think it's being able to learn about the companies that are driving the future forward, right? So for me, the market right now it stinks, right? There's no question we're in a bear market. No matter where you look, you're losing money. Even if you're holding cash, you're getting inflated out at about 8%. And that's tough. That's tough for everyone. But, you know, that's that's the negative side of what's going on right now. The positive side is the companies underneath these stocks and in some cases these cryptocurrencies are doing really great things for our day-to-day -day lives, right? They're making transport better, cheaper, faster, and more, more carbon neutral or negative, right? Uh, we're seeing advancements in AI that are changing the way we shop, the way we work, the way we play. You know, there are real advancements that are changing our These lives. These are real the things. Better. These aren't fake. This isn't pets.com. This is like real. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, some of the companies that fell 80 or 90%, just using Teladoc as an example, one in six Americans are Teladoc customers, right? They're on some sort of Teladoc plan. Okay. That stock fell, but the business is growing year over year like crazy. So I think being able to separate the equity from the business and then learning about the business and being excited about that and then just making smart decisions about what that means for you both personally as somebody who has a role in society and financially you know the things you decide to allocate your money to that's pretty exciting right like learning about the science behind google stock not just the search engine but the other million things they do is pretty yeah. cool even if the stock drops so that's kind of my my take i'd love to hear what you think is the way to grow the finance niche even if the market keeps going downward YouTube beef. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, you're in the right place. So it yeah, works. no, go ahead. No, I, I agree with you. I think uh, it will make a more healthy conversation two years from now because the equities is what got people into it in 2020, just like everything mooning, which we're about to talk about in a second. So if the equities are gone in terms of share price appreciation, then what's left? The actual company. Now, the question is, is and this is unknown, is viewership still going to stay if for the next two years, it's purely analyzing the company and not the equity because the equity price, you can't analyze it if it's just flat. Or if it keeps going down, it's not the most fun thing to analyze. So we're going to have to see if people really care about learning about the companies. And if they do, then we might have a generation of better investors two years from now because they'll know when the next bull run happens if the company is worth buying or not. Yeah. And I, I think like, let me let me just say something about that. I'm not here for the viewership, right? Like I actually do not care if my videos get a million views or 10,000 views, right? I'm here because I like learning about these companies and sharing what I found and if there's interest in these companies, great. I have videos on Pinterest, right? Like, and almost nobody clicked that video and that's fine because I made that video really for me, for what I learned about Pinterest. So if we get too attached, if creators, not just me and you, but like all creators, just get too attached to the numbers and keep churning out content like it's a sausage factory just to get views and dollars and ads, 
I think you're doing the community a real disservice. I've done this too, by the way. Like you can look at my thumbnails and you can see that I try to attract extra viewers for sure. But the ultimate thing you need to do, we all need to do is provide real value to help people understand whatever it is we're trying to explain, personal finance, science, even our philosophical ideas about technology, which is what you do a great job of, right? But just going for views, I think it's a reflection of the the broadness of your topic, not how good your content is, right? So I would encourage all creators to take a step back, not worry about the individual numbers and start treating your audience like a collection of people and just talking to them about the things you find fascinating and let YouTube bring the right people to you, regardless of if it's 10 people or 10 million. That's, that's the thing that I think you, I liked when you said about Pinterest. Like when I did deep dives on some stocks like Roku and Zoom, and I know those are a little bit more popular, but now I know what the thesis is behind this TV operating system and like Zoom's enterprise communication, trillion dollar potential. Like, like, and I'm just a smarter person for it. And like, so when I have a conversation, if I ever get invited to do a podcast, like you can, you can pull these facts out of your brain. It's like, why? But maybe 10 people watch the Pinterest video, but I know about Pinterest gets 948 million monthly active users. And you know, like, like I can say that stuff. Um, but if you never did the research, if you were only glued to the views and the housing crash and you just make 17 videos on that, it's like, well, are you actually even a smart person when you talk yeah. about people, you know? I see a lot of channels that exclusively focus on crashes and that those have some merit, I guess, but like, is that really the message and the sort of like mentality you want to spread across the finance community? Just everything's crashing all the time, right? I, I don't know. That's not the value I feel like adding, at least. No, there is no value in that. I mean, one or two videos here and there, yes, it's fine. But like if every video is like the crash is here, it's like, I don't care if- Yeah, you're, you're calling 20 out of the last three crashes, right? Like. All right, so I think that was a good conversation on finance, content creation, and YouTube. Let us know what you guys think in the comments, especially because the people watching this probably watch a lot of finance content. Uh, so we'd love to know your comments and your thoughts about the state of finance YouTube in general. Last topic for today is the past two year bull market. I have a very simple question. Was it fake or was it not fake? We know there was a global pandemic. We know the Fed pumped in a couple of five, six trillion dollars of liquidity in the market to make sure that asset prices didn't li quite literally collapse. We know we overstimulated the economy to some extent by printing trillions of dollars. And now all of that's gone. Now we're doing quantitative tightening. Now interest rates are going up. Interest rates were zero for the past three, five years. Does that mean that assets like Tesla and all these other crazy stocks that went bonkers only did so on the backs on the back of the Fed, or was there actual company growth that justified that level of premium on an asset? Do you, do you think all those stocks are going to go right back to normal like they were in 2019? So I think it was fake in the sense that it was stimulated by something that wouldn't normally occur in the markets, right? It's not every day that the Fed pumps trillions of dollars into the economy, and so much of that makes its way into the market. And one thing I actually learned as I was sort of researching this angle as well is it's not just the last two years. The Fed's actually been quantitative easing since 2008. So it's really a 14 year massive bull run. So depending on how much they tighten and how much they actually raise rates and what inflation does, there's a lot of variables here, but it could be that we see valuations return to something like they were somewhere closer to 2008, maybe 2012, 13, 14, if they take out the right amount of money to get it there and keep raising interest rates even higher than they suspect they have to now. And that points more towards not just how crazy valuation has gotten, but what that means for like the actual strength of the dollar, right? Because we're buying stocks and units of dollars. Yeah, it's, I mean, earnings, well, we'll see what happens with companies, but I mean, Tesla's earnings have been phenomenal the past couple of years. So have Apple. Totally. So have some totally. Other, so, but, but it's, I mean, in Zoom, they're doing a billion of revenue a quarter. Like it's insane, but it, it was $500 Zoom in particular during the pandemic, and now it's back to $100. So like, I guess the question is, was that that 500 just purely based upon uh, the quantitative easing? I think the answer definitely is yes, and obviously a lot of hype. Things have gotten back down to normal. But if, if the companies can keep crushing earnings, I think that's that's when like the market has got to recognize something of value. Like if Palantir grows at 60% or something, or something you're, like you can't keep a stock depressed that long. But if the whole reason the stocks were going up, even with phenomenal earnings, was because of this quantitative easing stuff and that's gone, then who knows? Sure. Yeah. And like one thing I want to point out is it's not just like, OK, the, the Fed is printing trillions of dollars, therefore assets all inflate. So what actually happens is when money is very cheap and easy to get, you can take bigger bets longer into the future. Right. So when we speculate on the value of a stock all of a sudden it's not it's 2023 or 2024 value we're willing to pay a premium for where we think it'll be in 2028 we're pricing in way more growth because that growth seems easier to attain as money gets tighter 
you need to shrink the window that you're willing to make concrete bets on. And as a result, companies that are, you know, you think have this hyperbolic growth, you can't talk about year four and five anymore. We're looking at one, two, and three years out. And what we're finding is the co- the increasing cost of money and the decreasing power of money. Many of these companies are still not yet profitable and therefore might not have enough cash to even last to years four, five, and six, right? When money was cheap, that didn't matter. Now that we're seeing that change, the actual math around valuations have changed. And then if a recession happens and consumers aren't spending that much, then the earnings of every company is going to suffer. Um, That's right. Along with, along with quantitative tightening. So it, like, it's a really interesting world we're in because as you said, for the past 14 years, we've been having something like this happen. Now interest rates are finally going up. The cost of acquiring money is more expensive. Quantitative tightening is happening. No Fed bailout this time because inflation is at 8%. So the next 18 months are going to be interesting. Either it's going to be sort of stagflation, which is what Ray Ray Dalio is saying what's happening, or earnings are going to be so phenomenal we break past this and inflation is going to go down, or it keeps going worse for us. And we will be covering all of that on The Catalyst over the next couple of months. (laughs) That's right. All right, that's it for us. Episode one of The Catalyst. We hope you guys enjoy. This is still experimental. Give us your raw thoughts. What do you think? Constructive criticism. We're all open to that. Uh, We want to keep this going for a very, very long time. Have a lot of interesting guests coming up. So looking forward to your feedback. Looking forward to what you guys think. I'm excited for it, man. I think it's going to be a really good discussion and a really good time. Let us know in the comments below with your thoughts. We are going to become the Lex Friedman of finance. Bye bye. (laughs) It's happening.